Hey everyone, my name is Sarah Levon and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I am back for the final coffee and questions for 2020. I cannot believe we made it to the end of this year. What an epic year it has been. And so I'm so excited to move into 2021 and all the hopeful things that are coming in 2021, including more coffee and questions. If you haven't been here already, coffee and questions is my opportunity to connect with you answer your questions from stories on Instagram. So I put out a question poll there every month and ask for your questions. I'm gonna answer your questions today. And then I'm also gonna answer your questions that you have posted in the comments down below on previous videos. So if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you subscribe, hit that little notification bell so that you're notified every time I post a new video. And then let's get going. Before I forget, I wanna mention about my phone case for today. So I just recently put this phone case on. This is from a woman here in LA who started her own company based on the fact that she had a baby and then they and then was trying to take pictures of her baby and her baby would never look at the camera. How many of you have this issue? I know for me, I had this issue with my nephew. I constantly have this issue with my nephew. And so she made these phone cases that are in big black and white images, which is what newborns can see. They're gonna be drawn to those like really bold, dark and light structures or shapes. And so she made these phone cases with the idea that it's something for them to look at and then their eyes are drawn to your phone, which helps you get better pictures. Plus the phone cases I think are so cute. So the company is called Myzel. They did send me this case. She has no idea that I am doing this. So surprise to you because I do actually think that it's such a clever idea when all of us are out, we're all taking a thousand photos of your newborn or your baby or your toddler or your child. And so when you have something that's gonna catch their eye, you're gonna likely get better pictures. Thought it was a great idea. So I will link them down below. I will probably try to find a promo code for you as well. I'll reach out and get one for you. Put that in the description box down below if you wanna grab yourself a super cute little eye catching for your baby phone case. All right, so we are getting to your questions. I'm gonna try to be as short-winded as possible. Knowing me, it's not gonna go so well, but I'll do my best. Let's head on over to Instagram. Um, now, before I do that, I actually just got off of a prenatal visit with one of my virtual clients. They are in Hawaii. So shout out to Gerald and Sarah. And so I was telling them that I was about to film this and I was like, do you have any questions for Coffee and Questions? She actually had the best question. So this is Sarah's question from Hawaii. She says that she saw online um, that Kourtney Kardashian pulled out her baby from her vagina when she delivered, or AKA like she delivered her own baby. Is that an option? Is that something we can do? Is that even safe? Was her question. So I will start with that one and then I'll get to Instagram because I think this one's really fun and we've seen it all. You've maybe seen that trend. That in theory could potentially be an option for you for your upcoming labor and birth. So here's what I would say. If you or even your partner is interested in actually delivering the baby, what would happen is that once baby's head is out, it's a great angle. <laughs> then the doctor would have you reach in, reach down. And then once their shoulders start coming, you would grab under the arms and just lift towards you. It's super simple. Honestly, once the head's out, then it's like the body just like <laughs> slithers its way on out so quickly and easily that this, yes, it would potentially be an option for you if your doctor feels safe with it. So this is a great question for your doctor. If it's something you're interested in, go to your doctor at the next prenatal visit or your midwife at the next prenatal visit and say, hey, look, I saw this thing. I heard about people delivering their own babies. Would it be okay if I reached down or my partner reached in and helped to deliver the baby? I know if you saw my sister's birth announcement video where they sang a song, you'll see pictures where my brother-in-law actually got to do this too. And it's so special and so sweet. And you can like, you're the first one to like grab and hold the baby and then mom or birthing person then gets the baby on their chest. I think it's like a very fun option for you given that your doctor says that it's safe. Now mind you, obviously in an emergency, then that would no longer be an option. But in theory, given that everything's, everything goes normal, Ask your doctor and then let me know if you or your partner deliver the baby because I think it's super fun. We're starting with a heavy hitter today, all right? So this is from A.B. Thompson. I actually mentioned this on my stories because when I put out the poll, I saw this question came in and I was like, ooh, hitting the sweet spot with me because if you don't know already, one of the things that Bundle Birth does is there's an entire branch of Bundle Birth nurses where we are helping these nurses who are a lot of times newer in their labor and delivery nurse career, even experience though. We have a bunch with a bunch of experience as well. 
that we are helping them to have the tools to better care for you. So we do online nurse mentorships. There's different trainings. I have a workshop coming up in April or in April, in March. I should know when it is. It's in, in March. And so one of the things that we um, strive to be here at Bundle Birth and Bundle Birth Nurses is evidence-based and ethical. And so part of being ethical and what ethical to me just means is that we're doing the right thing. So you as a patient ideally is doing the right thing for you and your baby and your body and your future, right? That your provider is there to do the right thing and give their best effort. Provider meaning doctor, midwife, nurse, anybody that comes in contact with you, that they're doing their absolute best to do what's absolutely best for you in a non-coercive, with no ulterior motives type way, okay? So let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt. So here comes her question and then I'm gonna get into my rant because I promised you that I would answer this question, so let's hit it up right away. A.B. Thompson says, the hospital nearest me has policies that I you must be laying down for delivery. Why? Follow-up part two question says, is it appropriate to say, nope, I will birth where and how I want, want regardless of the policy? Okay. This should be an entire YouTube video. I may pull it out as a clip or I'll probably just turn it into a future YouTube video so that we can talk about this because I know I mentioned I'm gonna do a patient rights video. It is high on my list, it is coming soon, but I wanna give you like one right and you have that is that you have the right to autonomy over your body. What does autonomy mean? It means independence. It means that you are the ruler of your body, that no one can tell you what you can and can't do with your body, that you, when you deliver and you go into the hospital, you are not signing up to be in jail, okay? You are signing up to walk in and say, please help me to be safe. Please provide your medical expertise to help me to navigate my decisions. But every single decision, whether you choose to do something that the doctor, midwife, nurse says, or whether you choose to refuse or decline is entirely your decision. Okay, we're starting there. Now, are there things that could go wrong? Are there reasons why somebody might want you to deliver on your back or might want you to be induced? Of course, okay? And I could go like on lists and lists and lists and lists of things that could come up along the way, okay? Instead of you being like, ah, no, you're just there to get me or ah, I'm scared of whatever it is, okay? And making decisions out of fear, that's not what we want, okay? So instead of that, what I want for you, my dream through bundle birth, bundle birth nurses, the world, like my life's mission is that you get to make decisions out of confidence. And part of you being here and educating yourself and taking advantage of all of the education that I've put out there is to empower you to do that, empower you to know how to ask the right questions. That's what my entire medical interventions class is about. And so when you know more, you're able to navigate those decisions and instead of feeling bullied into a decision that you feel like every decision is yours to make. I have said this for years. And so hospital policy, this is where like hospitals have policies for a reason. There is likely some solid evidence behind them making decisions. There's probably a fear of litigation or getting sued where they're literally legally trying to protect themselves, which is entirely fair. There are things that I do that I choose to do or not to do. One of those examples for me is I choose to, for liability purposes, only deliver in the hospital. I don't do home births or really birth center births. Occasionally I can get talked into it, but it's not something that I necessarily pursue. And so I'm making decisions like that. Your hospital has to make decisions like that, okay? And so knowing that they're filtering through safety, through evidence, and through avoiding litigation or getting sued or getting in trouble, that they're gonna set aside some policies for you, right? And those are guidelines to also help keep your medical team in check. This is becoming an entire YouTube video. I apologize, it's just like so passionate about this. I'm trying to wrap it up. Okay, so moral of the story is, if there's anything that you do not feel comfortable with, a policy where your doctor or midwife or somebody is telling you, you have to do this, you are a free person, you can do whatever you want so long as you understand the risks, the benefits, and the alternatives, what your other options are. And so if you're like, nope, I'm not delivering on my back, that's not what I want, then you tell them. But I would encourage you to have those conversations ahead of time because I would hate for you to be that person who's like, er, er, and just 
fighting the hospital system, what happens is you have these doctors, midwives, nurses, team that have given their lives to study this stuff, to be really good, that are there because they care, because they want to have compassion, because they like talking to patients. There's lots of other units they could go to where they didn't actually have to talk to anyone or care about their preferences. And so let's give them the benefit of the doubt and learn to navigate these scenarios and say and decide what's really important to you. Are there circumstances where delivering on your back is the best option? Absolutely, yes, there are occasional scenarios where yes, that could be the best for some, you know, and that might be your preference. And especially if that's your preference, then go for it. But are there times when you may choose after having the proper education of the benefits, the risks, and the alternatives that you may choose something else? thousand percent and that is your decision but you also have to know that you are accountable to that decision that if you make it no one's forcing you to do something you don't want to do but also then if something were to go wrong ideally your provider has said look look this is a risk and if it were to happen you have to feel comfortable with the outcome of what the risk is okay like if it actually happened in a poor way that then you'd be like well i chose that decision for myself okay so it goes hand in hand and this is where like having that that care team that you trust that care team where you have open communication and where again bundleberg nurses to me is one of the ways that we're going to really be able to make a difference for you in this so that people feel comfortable asking questions and they know they can get the information in a non-coercive not stressful way so that you can feel confident about the decision and also your provider can feel confident that they're not like oh my gosh i'm sitting here waiting for something bad to happen because of this decision right that they've done the education enough that hopefully like you can navigate those decisions together this is all called shared decision making if you care to know more about it so answer is the longest answer of my life is that um you can just say nope i will birth how i want but i would go about it lightly have these conversations ahead of time make sure you warn your care team that like this is really important to you this is how i want to do it um and then let me know how it goes <laughs> in the comment box down below the twinkle says, isn't effacement a better predictor than dilation? And the answer to this is that blah, yes and no, flex and flow. This is one of those like, it's more of a big picture thing. Does effacement matter? A thousand percent. And I would say the most important is probably station. So how high or low your baby is. But if we're looking between dilation or effacement, and by the way, you'll learn all about this in my labor prep class. So you know exactly what I'm talking about in every way possible. And so that effacement thinning, the thinner it is, the more stretchy it is. And in theory, the more easily it dilates. But I will say just anecdotally that first time moms typically thin before they dilate, whereas second, third, fourth time moms, what we call multips, a lot of times dilate before they efface. So it's sort of a bigger picture thing. We care about both. Either way, if somebody checks you and you've had any change, more effacement, more dilation, the baby's lower, you're good. We're moving in the right direction. Ooh, this is good. Okay. Mrs. Lauren Hayes says postpartum bleeding. What is normal versus what is not? When to call the doctor? How long it could last, etc. So as far as postpartum bleeding goes, regardless whether you had a vaginal birth or a cesarean, you will bleed like a heavy period. Okay. So expect that. Have some pads on hand. They'll give you like the largest pads of your life in the hospital that you'll be like, what? And then you'll get them and be like, wow, these are amazing. Cause you actually need them to be that big. So in general, couple of rules of thumb. One is that your bleeding should always be more to less over time. It is somewhat normal to have some sort of abnormal bleeding for up to six weeks afterwards with like some minor spotting. If you've been pretty inactive and then all of a sudden you get up and you're more active in the daytime, you go for a walk, you might see some more bleeding. That's okay. But in general, if you're like bleeding heavily and say a week later, you're like barely spotting and then all of a sudden you fill a pad, that's abnormal, right? It's not more to less, it's more to less to more, and that's would warrant a call to your OB or your midwife. That's number one. Number two would be in general, if you're filling a pad or more in an hour or less, so meaning you fill it up in an, less than an hour, that's too much bleeding, okay? The other thing is clots. So it is normal to see some clots. So this would just be like pooled blood that when, especially when you're laying flat, you have blood, it has, has different, types of cells like platelets and other clotting factors in the blood that causes the blood to coagulate or form like a little like 
jello ball kind of thing. <laughs> and so basically when it sits there, instead of it just flowing out, it sits and then all those cells can like coagulate the blood and they turn it into a clot, which is just like a, like I said, like a ball of jiggly, chunky blood. <laughs> and so if you, let's say, get up or something after you've been laying down for a while, you might see like golf ball or softball size clots come out of you. If it's golf ball size in general, and this is where I would check in with your OB and they'll give you a specific recommendation. Most providers are okay with golf ball size, which if you're not in the United States, you don't know what a golf ball looks like. It's like probably about that big. Um, but a softball is like that big. Okay. So it's significantly larger, right? If anything bigger than, than like something round like that, then call your doctor. The other thing is think about your symptoms. If all of a sudden you're bleeding a lot, like you're like, wow, I'm kind of gushing blood and I feel kind of lightheaded. I might feel kind of nauseous. I look pale. Um, your heart's beating fast. Definitely like in that case, especially if you're at home, that would warrant like a 911 call, loosely speaking. Um, but if you're in the hospital, that would definitely say like call your nurse and they will, they will go from there as far as preventing bleeding because postpartum bleeding is one of the biggest, if not the biggest risk in the postpartum period. So more to less, golf ball size or less, otherwise call, and then filling a pad or more in <laughs> an hour or less are my rules of thumb for postpartum bleeding. This person says, feeling silly for asking, but, so I'm not gonna give her name just in case she feels like she wants to be anonymous, um, lubricant for delivery. This is not a silly question. I told somebody today in a meeting, like for me, there's no silly questions. In fact, if you stump me with a silly question or one that I'm like, oh, that's a new one. I love it because it's very rare for me to come across a question that I've never heard before. So please try and throw them in the comment box down below and we'll see how crazy your questions can get, which is like the fun of my job, honestly. So lubricant for delivery, absolutely. So you have a lot of natural lubricants down there that like the amniotic fluid and even your cervical mucus, like your mucus plug, all of that helps to lubricate the area. But if you've been pushing for a while or it's not, it's not quite super slippery down there, a lot of times in the hospital, they will use an oil of sorts in the hospital. Usually that is mineral oil. And mineral oil, your doctor will just pour on the perineum or in your vagina hole and kind of rub back and forth just to kind of like slip and slide that baby out of you. You can also, if you're like meh to the mineral oil, you could bring coconut oil, you could bring almond oil. I've seen mostly coconut oil off the top of my head, but people will bring some sort of organic liquid form oil and use that to lubricate the area to slip and slide this baby out of you. Just like that. These two kind of go hand in hand from Kendall Bradstreet and I'm Jo Hansen. So I'm Jo Hansen says tips for managing transition during labor. And if you don't know what transition is, take my labor prep class. They talk you through all of it. Um, and then Kendall says urge to push at eight centimeters. Um, short story with transition is transitions just eight to 10 centimeters. So you go hand in hand, but told to try not to, it's hard to breathe through contractions due to this tips for eight centimeters, wanting to push slash getting through transition. So transition is hard. I will say that super duper clear that transition is the most challenging part of labor. It's also the shortest part of labor, which is great, but at eight centimeters, this is gonna be, actually this would probably be about eight centimeters if I'm being honest, I would tip this, but hold on. Okay, I created some space. So say this is eight centimeters. If this baby, let's say, is bigger than the, than the top of the rim of the mug, <laughs> bear with me, look at my vaginal exam video because that definitely comes from a vaginal exam video. So imagine the top of the head, it's round. So this bottom part of the head is gonna dip down into the vagina while there's still something blocking the baby from going directly into the vagina which can cause that urge to push. So what I would say is that because, instead of gravity at this point, if somebody's telling you not to push, the, the point of that is that there's still cervix there and that cervix, if it's really tight, all that pressure and pushing through it could tear the cervix or swell the cervix, which neither one are good. So that's why there's rationale for it. It feels like torture, but it's really, it may feel, it may actually feel like torture <laughs> inside, but there is, there is method to the madness. So what I would say is turn on all fours, flip your butt in the air. So you're using gravity to go against which the direction of the, where the baby is putting more and more pressure and urge to push in your pelvis. Flip upside down, kind of like my engage the baby video when I show you that like minor inversion. 
flip upside down and then on either side of the tailbone. So you have like butt crack down the middle. I'm just gonna try to show you, but like wish me luck here, okay? So if you look at my butt, my butt crack is here. On either side of my tailbone, there's like smushy booty meat, okay? We're looking for the booty meat. I hope that makes sense, it's very technical of me. All right, but you're going like find the middle where it's your tailbone and then about like I'd say two to three inches out, you're gonna find like soft butt like here, okay? So I can't see, this is hilarious, oh my gosh. Okay, but like here, okay? And then, and then, I don't know if that was at all helpful but you sort of get the idea. <laughs> That and then your partner, nurse, doula, somebody takes a knuckle or a thumb and presses, that can help release the tension on your perineum to prevent you from pushing too early. So there's like a pressure point on either side of your butt cheeks and then flipping upside down will help with that. The other tips I have for transition are to breathe, to set yourself up with a support team that can really step in. I say for me, like, if I have a client that's in labor and they get to that eight centimeter mark, like I anticipate jumping in and being much more active with them, talking them through every single contraction, planning to just reassure, reassure, reassure at that point that we're getting there, you're doing amazing, lots of position changes, listening to the body, listening to that urge and instinct to push. If you feel that instinct that like, how I go about it, and your provider may have a different recommendation, but my nursing education wise would be that you just, that you bear down with the urge to push. If you don't feel an urge to push, don't rush it. Um, but then it would be like giving into your sensations and then focusing on your breath and finding a focal point slash having somebody there that's ready to step in to like really help you to get through that transition part. It's hard. Also, if you take my coping with labor class, that will help you get through it because you definitely need some tools to cope if you intend to go through transition without an epidural. With an epidural, less so, but that would be more to get you to the hospital to get your epidural. Okay, I am long-winded. <sighs> okay, one more. Okay, I had two questions about surrogacy. I don't know if I've ever had a question about surrogacy on here, so I am loving it. So Kay's the name says, coping with labor as a surrogate, do's and don'ts, and how to please the parents, which is very interesting. And then somebody else asked me, this is Kelly Ray says, have you ever witnessed a surrogate birth? And if so, what was it like? So I have witnessed a surrogate birth. I've witnessed a few. I came from Beverly Hills where that was somewhat common. We had a lot of like different dynamics when it came to how people birthed their babies. And so um, I thought it was beautiful. I think it was, it's very interesting to see the birthing person birth a baby that's not their baby um, and to be able for the, the, like especially the mom to be in the room with their partner if they have one and get to experience the labor and birth and participate together. There's like a different bond from my experience that happens. And some people choose to go about it differently that like they only come in at the end, they don't have that relationship up to the surrogate and the, the parents. And so um, I would say as far as like tips for coping with labor, I think for one, to set up really clear expectations going into it as far as what your coping with labor strategy would be. And also recognizing that technically it's still your body that has to go through it. And for somebody in my humble opinion, this is total opinion here, not medical advice again, but that in my opinion, for somebody to force you to go through something super excruciating when that's not what you would want, like if you were having surgery and giving someone your kidney, they would say that they, like no one would argue with you whether or not you should have anesthesia for that, right? So I think birth is kind of weird in that way. And so I think you should still have the rights to your body and to your labor. Um, obviously listening to the parents and saying and taking that into consideration, but I would say that most things on like the safe side are relatively very safe when it comes to coping with labor options. And if you don't wanna go without an epidural and you don't want pain medication options that I think they should be supportive of that too and probably provide you with like a doula or ha let a labor support person be there to help you because going without is, is hard enough and to do it alone makes it even harder. So I think setting clear realistic expectations with your family, 
making sure that you're on the same page as far as like them recognizing that it's your body and you still have the right to autonomy over your body is gonna be really important. And then do what you want. Okay, we're going to YouTube. Let's see if I can find your questions because I did not prepare for this at all. We're just gonna scroll and see what more the more recent questions have been. Okay, haha. <laughs> this is from my setting the labor mood, having a calm hospital birth experience video, which is one of my most recent videos. I think it's my most recent video. Um, they say your second baby comes fast. Is this true if your second is a VBAC or does your body think it's your first baby? This comes from Sarah Gutierrez. So Sarah, um, if you haven't had a vaginal birth, really when they say second baby, what they mean by that is second vaginal birth. So that first vaginal birth, no matter if it was your first pregnancy or not, typically does come faster. Did I say that right? <laughs> if it's your first baby, if it's your first vaginal birth, they're gonna go slower than the second ones. Flex and flow, everybody's different. Um, but in general, if you're a VBAC, expect it to go like it's your first baby. Oh, this is good. Okay. Dodd Nadal says, can, this comes from my induction of labor at 39 weeks, says, can they induce labor while the head is not engaged to the pelvis? The answer to this is a thousand percent yes. I don't know if I've ever seen a provider choose to induce or not based on whether or not the baby was engaged. That honestly, even for labor, sometimes your baby is in engaged in the early parts of labor and as labor goes on, that's what brings baby down, which engagement just means baby is lowering into the pelvis. So the answer is yes. I would also wanna add that even if you're in labor, please don't stress and obsess about, that's what's gonna be one of my phrases, don't stress and obsess. <laughs> no stressing, no obsessing about whether or not the baby is engaged. You wanna do all the things I talk about in my engaging the baby video, cause that will help you. But in, the baby engages with the contractions throughout labor. You don't expect the baby to be fully engaged or you would likely be like seeing the head, right? That's like the lower the baby is. So that's a process, it happens over time. Ideally, yes, do we want baby lower and lower? Will that help you? Yes, but it's also not a reason not to induce, especially if there's a medical indi indication. Of course, I'm gonna answer this one, Kristen Nall. She says, I can't seem to find any in-person childbirth classes. Are there some available virtually? Of course there are, I got you. So I have, you know this, if you've been watching me at all, I have all sorts of classes online um, with all the things that you need. If you're a VBAC, I got a VBAC class. Coping with labor, everyone should take. Everyone should take the childbirth class. I have infant safety and CPR. You can schedule a one-on-one -on -one with me, potentially virtual support although I am booking up, um, so let me know, but don't worry, there's still childbirth classes available and they're all online, on demand, lifetime access over at bundlebirth.com. Okay, so this comes from Creative Man is Back Ruby from my C-section recovery video. They say, um, what about taking the catheter out? Can you tear when they take it out or have complications when they take out the catheter? So with a C-section or with an epidural, typically you're going to have a urethral catheter that goes into your bladder. There's catheter, so the word catheter really just means tube and it's just where they place the tubes. You could have a Foley catheter, which typically is like for your pee. You could have a cervical catheter that goes in your cervix for induction, et cetera, okay? So when they put in that catheter that drains your pee because during a C-section or an epidural, you lose control of your bladder function and more often than not, your bladder actually fills up more than you like pee yourself. And so can it you tear when they pull it out? No, not typically because it's like the size of your pee hole. Inside there's a balloon that they fill up and that's what keeps it from coming out. So if, I suppose if you were to like yank it out, please don't do that. You will not be a happy camper later in life. Um, that could be a problem. Or if it's not fully de deflated, the balloon isn't fully deflated when they go to pull it out, but your nurse is gonna feel resistant. So I can't imagine that really being something you should worry about. The complications of taking out a catheter, honestly, it's more the complications of having the catheter and the risk to having a catheter. Biggest one we think about is infection because we call that catheter a vector or something that can allow for bacteria to creep up into your urethra. And if you've ever had that happen before, that would equal a urinary tract infection. And so the risk of a catheter is a UTI, urinary tract infection, 
um, flex and flow. If you have a C-section or an epidural, it's sort of a non-negotiable, like it comes with the package. So that might just be a risk that you have to take. Otherwise your alternative would be to just not have a C-section or an epidural. Um, so talk to your provider if you're worried about it, but yes, you do have a catheter and the biggest risk is UTI. Not super duper big because they use sterile technique. Hopefully they've used sterile technique and then um, not typically going to tear on the way out. Okay, this is a fun ending one. <laughs> this is so random, guys. This is, you're gonna be like, huh? But this comes from my last coffee and questions with Justine of Bundlebird Nurses. This is probably a nurse, so I'm not forgetting you nurses. Um, if you want more nursing related videos, please let us know because we could do some more like nursey themed videos. They might be interesting for you as a patient or not, and they may also be interesting for nurses. So we'll, we'll see about that. So LD Baldera says, what are the best nursing shoes? I'm always looking for an awesome pair. And my answer to that would be, I always wore Dansko's. I also had a pair of orthotics that I put in some Nikes, just some regular tennis shoes. But Dansko's are great because you can wipe them down. So I wore Dansko's forever. The other new brand that I love and um, have heard great things about is Clove. I can link them down below as well. So that is my quick answer to the nursing shoe. <laughs> question, which is so fun and random. Thank you guys so much for being with me here today. If you have other questions for future coffee and questions, make sure you put them in the comment box down below. I typically do go back to my previous coffee and questions to look for questions to answer on the next one. Merry Christmas to all of you. Happy Hanukkah, happy Kwanzaa, happy holidays to everyone. I just, I know I'm not alone in the fact that like, we have made it. So I also want to acknowledge like congratulations to all of us. 2020 has been a challenging year. It has also been a thrilling year. And 2021, I am so confident and hopeful that 2021 is going to be such a turnaround year for us. That so many beautiful babies are going to be born. So many second, third, fourth, fifth time babies are going to be born. For those of you that are maybe struggling with, with infertility or getting pregnant, I am with you. I feel you. I send my love to you. I have some interesting new videos coming in that realm as well. So stay tuned here. If you haven't subscribed, make sure you subscribe down below. Head on over to Bundle Birth and pick up your online class or hit me up if you wanna work with me one-on-one. -on -one. I am here for you. And then until next time, don't forget to flex and flow and I will see you soon. Bye. I'm back. <laughs> so my goal today is to have fun while filming. Airplane. It's a loud airplane. Oh, that's hot. I don't think I have you around. Not that it matters. It's all good. Okay, we gotta watch the rules. The little poochers. No poochers. Right here is good, huh, Bri? <laughs> Bri guy, this thing is wrong. You guys just have a lot of really nice things to say. <laughs> Goodbye. Bye 2020. See you later. See you in 2021. 2021. Bye.